everybody. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, good uh, evening. Uh, so welcome to the third webinar of the uh, Education and the Society webinar series jointly organized by Jinto and the Sino-Finnish Education Research Center, Jolie. Before we start, let me take you through our webinar protocols. Please remember this webinar is being recorded and the parts of the webinar that were allowed to be shared by our speakers will be available on the website of the Jinto Network and the Sino-Finnish Education Research Center. The presentation slides will also be available there. During the webinar, please keep yourself muted unless you are asked to speak or ask a question at the Q&A part. You can keep your video on if you wish. We recommend using the speaker view that can be selected in the top right corner of your Zoom screen so that you could clearly see who is speaking. To ask a question, please use the chat function to indicate your question or comment. And then the facilitator will invite you to raise the question in the Q&A part. All will read it to the speakers. When you are invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, turn on your camera, state your name and which institution you are from. Today's webinar is on the topic, regional universities transformation in China, what can be learned from the reforms of Finnish universities of applied sciences. The agenda is as follows. So after my introduction to the speakers, each of the speaker will give a 15 minutes presentation. Then I will facilitate some discussion dialogues between them. In the end, the speakers will respond to questions and comments from the audience. Please write your questions and comments during the presentation and the dialogues between the panelists. The webinar will end at quarter past seven Beijing time and quarter past two Finnish time. So now I will introduce uh, the two distinguished speakers in today's webinar. Dr. Po Yang is associate professor with Turner, chair of the Department of Economics of Education and Administration at the Graduate School of Education, Peking University. She is also a research fellow at the China Institute of Education Finance Research, Peking University. She serves as the vice president of China Association of Education Finance Research and has been working as a consultant for the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and the Ford Foundation. Her main teaching and research areas are economics of education, education finance, and vocational and technical education reform evaluation. She has work experience in leading research universities in the US and the Netherlands. She has published in peer-reviewed SSCI journals and received research grants from China's National Science Foundation and the Ministry of Education. Dr. Ritova Lakso Maninen has 30 years of experience in the management of higher education, IT services, and the banking sector. She was the president of Haga Helia University of Applied Sciences for 16 years. She has acted as the chair of the Finnish University of Applied Sciences Rector's Conference. She has worked in the International University Council in Germany and in higher education development projects in South Africa, Colombia, and Ireland. She is the founding partner at the Professional Publishing Finland Limited Cooperation. She holds a PhD in management and she has written books and articles on strategic competency and management and sustainable renewal. She was granted the Finnish 
honorary title of a higher education counselor by the president of the Republic of Finland in 2019. So thank you once again uh, for the speakers joining today and also uh, welcome all the audience. So now I will first give the floor to uh, uh, Dr. Yang uh, to start introduction of the Chinese university transformations. Thank you, Dr. Yang, our floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tsai. Now I can uh, share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunities uh, to meet all of you online. Uh, even though the current pandemic uh, is now allow us to meet offline, uh, I think the forum, especially uh, thanks, special thanks to, uh, to Julie and also Jen Hope to provide these opportunities uh, for knowledge sharing, also building new connections between us. Um, today's topic is really about the regional university development uh, here in China and also the common grounds and also similarities and differences between our system and the Finnish system. So I'm looking forward uh, to have a lot of uh, conversations and dialogue between us. Uh, I think according to the uh, to the courtesy of, to the procedure of the two webinars before, uh, we have a very short opening discussion about our uh, uh, respective system, and then we, we will have a lot of discussion uh, afterwards. So today, my uh, my presentation will have uh, a focus on introduce you to the regional university systems uh, here in China. First of all, I want to introduce uh, so-called variety of regional universities here in China. And then uh, I introduce some of the results from our empirical research on the regional university systems here in China, based on uh, uh, my research team with uh, Professor Guo Jianru and uh, other faculty members in Graduate School of Education at the Peking University. Uh, basically, we uh, have. We, I want to focus some of the results. Our uh, our results on the impact of the regional university transformation on the university industry linkage on the applied research, uh, applied education model, and also student development in these regional universities. So before we go, uh, I want to introduce you to the Chinese university system. Uh, actually, I have a couple of publications uh, years ago to introduce the stratification of the, of the China's higher education system. Um, here you can see we have this kind of hierarchical uh, structure very clearly laid out. So the national central universities or central universities affiliated to the Ministry of Education or other ministries was on the top of the pyramids. Uh, we have only about 120 uh, such universities. They have this kind of national uh, prestige. And then below that, you have this massive uh, regional universities, uh, public ones, and also something we call independent universities or independent colleges. So, uh, this is in the middle of the pyramids. And then on the bottom, you have both public and private vocational three-year institutions, uh, which provided something uh, like associate degrees in the United States. Uh, we call it uh, Zhuan, which is uh, uh, something like associate degrees um, in the international comparison. But interesting enough, if you use the international standards of higher education categorizations uh, to apply to the Chinese systems, uh, we can see the National Research University were occupied um, the uh, ISCD 64. So they were research oriented. Uh, they were have this academic orientation. For the institutions in the middle, so it's this really weird or mixture of uh, missions here, uh, we can generally call them professional orientation uh, institutions. But interesting enough, even the regional universities or regionally newly established universities here, uh, we mentioned they also have this kind of academic research orientation, even though they have more uh, providing professional orientation educations to the audience. And in the bottom, uh, interesting enough, uh, we call the vocational colleges, uh, public and private ones, uh, usually they can consider at the level five. So they were at CD55, mainly providing uh, vocational education to the, um, uh, to the population. So, um, the regional university system have experienced two massive expansion in China, not only the recent one starting 1999, because this is the most famous one. But what, what I want, want to mention is the regional university was interesting concept, which come into being, especially after the Cultural Revolution in the 70s, 60s and 70s. 
when China started to open their doors to the world in early 1980s, uh, there has been a, a urge of the rush into developing regional university systems here in China. Uh, especially around 83, 1983, 85, uh, there have been a lot of courage or encouragement from the very top leadership to developing short cycle programs, uh, uh, applied orientation research, um, higher education institutions in China at the regional level. Uh, especially in this action plan for the 21st century issued in 1999, this indicating the starting point of the latest tertiary expansion uh, there have been a lot of policy initiatives put, uh, policy measures put uh, on the ground to encourage the development of short uh, three-year vocational colleges and also four-year universities with applied orientation. Um, so here I give a very uh, simple stati statistics about institutional growth. So on the right-hand side, you can see very clearly, this is a higher, higher education providers at the level six and level five. Um, so the, uh, the, the green line indicate the level six and the uh, dark uh, uh, one, the, the, the black one was the level five. So you can see the trends of growing after 1999. So there's is a massive increases over time. Um, so this is, uh, oh, sorry, I, I reverse, reverse order. Sorry, the, the dark uh, black one was uh, level six. So it's just indicating, you know, the regional university systems actually growing during this time period, starting from uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, this is a critical because when we talk about the regional university transformation, the, the first important thing is to understanding where it come from. So many of the regional universities actually upgraded from the three-year uh, vocational colleges uh, into the four-year uh, bachelor degree granting institutions in China uh, in the past 20 years. So we call it newly established. Um, regional universities. But there have also been some institutions that always been four-year providers, but they were affiliated to specific industries uh, like forestry, textile, um, or oil industry. So they have been specialized, very uh, very small, uh, very narrow niche in the market, and then they grow into comprehensive regional four-year institutions. So um, in the past 10 years, uh, the context has been changed because China is starting to have this very highly selective research, public research universities competing at the international uh, level, uh, which call, we call double first class universities or project 985 or project 211 universities. And then in the middle, so there's a new kind of ways of thinking or strategy to push the regional university into the applied orientation. Uh, this is clearly a policy shift uh, in the at the national level because we already have this very selective research university at the top, and then we want to put in the regional universities on the ground to support uh, to support the regional economy. So, in uh, here, I just mentioned two very briefly policy initiatives at the national level. One is at the uh, 2015, and one is 2019. So, both of the policies encourage. So the first one encouraged the newly established regional universities um, to kind of transform into applied orientation, not only in the education model, not only to provide applied oriented orientation, but also to conduct applied research. Um, so this is interesting uh, kind of uh, strategy because initially all these regional universities try to become uh, at the level six, but they want to be in the ICD um, 64, which is academic oriented. But now the national government actually pushed them to 65, which is more professional applied oriented. And then starting 2019, there are a new group of providers or competitors come into play, which we call higher vocational ed education. So this used to be three year vocational colleges and they were upgraded to the baccalaureate degree granting institution level. Um, so now they can provide uh, education. So they can provide uh, applied education to students and also uh, granted their bachelor degrees. They used to only can, uh, previously they can only grant in their associate degrees. All right. Um, so I give one special program. Actually, we, we analyze it uh, with the empirical data later on with outstanding engineer programs and new, new engineering program or projects. Uh, this is with a special focus on regional university to expanding their uh, STEM majors, especially engineering majors. So uh, the national and the uh, provincial government give a lot of incentive to regional universities to enhancing their adaptiveness to the local economies, especially through the engineering programs. 
Uh, now we see some key challenges here facing Chinese regional universities. Here I give a, a chart on the right hand side, uh, which is not very precise, but I think the indicative uh, at least. So uh, previously in China, higher education institutions only have two types. Either you're providing general education or you provide vocational education. So we have on the horizontal line, we have a general and vocational. But now you have a more complicated situation because the leadership, the top leadership also decided to separate uh, universities into more uh, academic or basic research oriented versus applied research oriented. So now you have another dimension, which is the basic and applied. So, um, so regional universities have to make a choice. They have to make their decision. Uh, they want to do more applied in education model and research model, but they don't want to be to do vocational. So this is a very, how do we say, delicate issues because um, the problem in Chinese uh, kind of uh, context, being applied is almost similar to being vocational. Um, so this idea about vocational education is um, pretty much very prevalent uh, conceptualization as applied education model. Um, so here, regional university really have to jump in behind, jump, jump in between these two uh, thin lines. And the other one is to do applied education only or to do both applied education and applied research. Because as I mentioned earlier, in the academic uh, pyramids, in the, in the university um, systems, universities can only uh, up market by doing academic research, by getting this academic orientation research. You can moving upward to the elite universities. So even regional university adopted this applied education model, they are not necessarily also want to do applied research because they have this concern for reputation. So they want to do both applied and basic research, especially when the applied, uh, when the applied research can bring in funding, but the academic research can bring in a lot of reputations. And so the last two questions really uh, in terms of uh, educational finance, so the regional universities right now, especially uh, at the four-year institution level, the 60 to 70% of their revenue coming from the, we call budget allocation. So they're coming from the government. However, there's also the push from the uh, regional government and also the central government to ask them to diversify their revenue uh, sources, uh, especially to getting more resources from industries or university uh, industry linkages. Uh, but this also means you have to uh, adopt this kind of applied research and applied education model. So this is a lot of different com uh, conflicting forces uh, into play. Uh, so um, I, I will be very quick about some of the recent research we have been conducted in China about research university, uh, sorry, regional universities uh, in 2016 through 2018. So this is a basic information. We do both questionnaires and also interviews and a lot of field studies observations. So in terms of university industry linkage, right now, the, most of the regional universities uh, within the university, all, uh, almost 70% of their majors have university uh, involved with a university collaboration. And then um, the uh, average, each discipline, for instance, uh, mass or uh, industry, uh, chemistry or, or economics, on uh, average, each, uh, uh, each discipline have almost eight industry partners. So it's quite significant in terms of compared to vocational colleges. So the number is actually higher than vocational colleges. Um, the second one is really about the applied research. So this is a survey about university leadership and also the faculty member here uh, in China. So we're asking, uh, do they agree uh, on the left-hand side, all these forces actually increase the research orientation of applied research orientation in the universities? So we can see the only significant, only significant ones which increases the applied research orientation of the faculty members was actually happened at the university level. For instance, university planning and the resources, disciplinary structure and the focus at the university, university level on practical uh, teaching and training. Many of the policies at the school level, at the school levels doesn't really have any uh, significant impact, for instance, uh, school position in applied research or school level practical training evaluation doesn't really increase faculty involvement in applied research. So how about the uh, adoption of, oh, sorry, adoption of the uh, uh, applied education? Uh, we use similar kind of uh, 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 explanatory variables. Here we can see, uh, interesting enough, 
uh, many of the school level innovations or school levels uh, orientation towards applied research or practical training and evaluation actually have influence on a, a faculty members adopting a more applied education model. So interesting enough, it rises because at the, for the faculty members on the university kind of uh, disciplinary power influence their orientation towards applied research. But, uh, but only the school level practices actually influence their orientation towards applied uh, education model. So how about the, this kind of transformation towards applied research and applied education model actually have on student development? Um, here we can see in the group of university students who actually in this applied educational model, uh, we can see many of, the, uh, of their performance measurements actually better than, the, than their peer students now in the applied education model. Here we get, for instance, this is student self-evaluate uh, growth uh, in professional and technical capacity. We find students in this transformation group is significantly higher, right? and also their critical thinking and the innovation capacity. However, interesting enough, the starting salary, they're kind of, when they enter into the labor market, they didn't get substantially higher. Uh, actually, they, they, their starting salary was lower in student who were in, uh, in the university who doesn't experience this transformation. Um, so um, in conclusion, uh, we can see in China, the transformation of the regional university already taking place as I already mentioned, uh, but the impact uh, is yet to observe because the time period was quite short. Um, so we still have uh, more challenges ahead. Uh, actually, I think the current transformation bring more challenges than answers to, to the regional universities. The first one and foremost one is always positioning, how to position themselves in the market. What is the unique, uh, unique organizational niche for Chinese regional university? So back to my chart, uh, can you be uh, being both applied and, and also doing basic research? Or can you be both general and vocational in terms of education models? So there have always been these issues. So regional universities have to, have to define their unique missions, unique combination of the service type. The second one is really about resource allocation and bargaining power because the regional universities, they're dealing with different levels of regional government. Some of the universities are affiliated to the provincial government, but some of the universities, I think in the case of Finnish US, they're affiliated to the municipal government. So different levels of government have different policy agendas and their resource allocation model are quite different. So it's quite complicated for regional university to decide to which level of government they want to prioritize either as, as their uh, service providers and also the beneficiaries. And second, the third one was really about the enrollment, competi en enrollment competition because of declining uh, age cohort. Uh, the, the last one, uh, uh, maybe we can discuss later is about adopting uh, University of Applied Sciences model from other countries. Uh, there have always been issues involving institu institutional distance, but I can come back to this uh, points later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yang. So that's a really excellent presentation. I think uh, Chinese higher education system is quite complicated and it's also not very easy for international audience to clearly see what are regional universities, how is the transformation going on in the Chinese policy context. I think you have nicely presented the reform, the, 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 the process, outcomes, as well as some challenges. For instance, you know, uh, as you have shown the, uh, the pyramid in the very beginning about the Chinese higher education structure that's also indicate clearly indicate the challenges facing by the regional universities because the, they are in a lower position you 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 put the positioning at the first challenge but also uh, the academics individuals in the regional university they are also facing some dilemmas so because they want to develop their academic career. So they need to do research if they want to stay in the higher education. But uh, the policy push is that uh, the staff members need to also change their work orientation to be more application oriented. But as you said, application is almost equal to vocational, which is somehow seems to be, uh, you know, uh, 
and a lower status to academics. So you have nicely presented the challenges. So very important to talk for the audience. I think now is also good to start uh, to uh, uh, begin the Finnish case. So uh, Ritawa, you are welcome to uh, give your talk about the experience of Finnish UAS reforms. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation to this very interesting webinar and good afternoon, good evening to everyone. So, do, I do you think... want me to share the slides? Yes, thank you. So, this is not the first one. Yes, here we start. So the question to me was, uh, what can be learned from the Finnish Universities of Applied Sciences reform? And uh, in the next, uh, you can see the content of my presentation. I have there two parts, first the question why, and then what are the most important steps and best practices in the Finnish reform. And next we will start with the why question. The Finnish universities of applied sciences were established in the beginning of 1919s. And it was the time where, when there was the global recession. And the very important task was rebuilding the economy. And also, the Universities of Applied Sciences was an answer to this, this challenge. At the same time, of course, there were the megatrends, and uh, they will even today be, be, be the drivers of change, but also at that time. And the world of work was uh, changing and the competence requirements were changing. So new kind of education was needed. The competence needs were different. It was necessary that the employees have, have theory and study theory and practice together. And uh, it was also important to strengthen the relationships between education and business sectors. And also the universities of applied sciences were an alternative to academic universities. There were very many high school graduates who couldn't go to universities because there was not enough studying places. So something was needed. And uh, also the idea was when the status of the vocational education was not so high that the, the path to professional higher education would make the uh, status of vocational, higher, uh, vocational education higher. And then, then there would be more options for lifelong learning in, in professional Higher, higher education. So there was many, many reasons to start establish the uh, universities of applied sciences. And, and in Finland, the solution was so that they were formed by merging colleges. And like you can see from the Hakahelia example that the oldest uh, college uh, down there was Helsinki Business College. It uh, had been established 1881. So, and, and all it was, it was old brand like the other other colleges. So they were old, they were famous, they were competent in traditional education. But that kind of education, what they offered, was not enough anymore. So. The next um, education in universities of applied sciences 
uh, or something else. It aims at producing professionals, professionals who can work in expert positions or entrepreneurs and participate in development at work. And I think that was the big difference earlier. The idea was that the employees, they, they will do their work, they will do what is said, but now the idea and need in the business was that the employees have to be able to develop the work. And the degree studies, they give a higher education qualification and at the same time, practical professional skills. And what is the Big difference is that uh, here the studies include about uh, six months practical on, on the job learning period. So when the education change, it also mean next please, essential changes in teaching. If we simplify, we can say that in, in the colleges, the teaching was knowledge sharing and the idea was more or less that the teacher knows everything. And uh, the teachers also got ready-made curriculas. There was the Board of Vocational Education, which was under the Ministry of Education and all, all the curriculas were accepted there and they, they were used in, in uh, every, every college. Today in universities of applied sciences, I, I think what is important is that they, they learn to collect and process information. And they have to be active, they have to be independent, they are learning by doing and, and they learn theory and practice together. And all these changes have changed the role of the teacher significantly. Teachers are still professional in pedagogy, but uh, at the same time, they are developers of their own work and their work community. And even they are builders of the future of working life. So the role is much more wide. So when we think about the uh, links with the industry and we compare to the history and the colleges, we can say that the, in, in the previous colleges, there were no connections between companies and colleges. And now, the universities of applied sciences, it's, it's very important that they have strong links. It starts on the strategic level and in practice, it means, for example, different kind of advisory boards supporting the degree programs, uh, invited lecturers, uh, faculty contacts with the companies and uh, it's uh, important that also the directors have uh, contacts with the companies and, for example, they can act as uh, company board members. And research and development is, is carried out for the bene benefit of companies. And also there is the uh, cooperation not only, only in company level, but also in union level like in cooperation with trade unions and associations. Yes. Uh, EU Commission has uh, listed uh, diverse higher education links with the in industry, covering learning, uh, R&D, valorization and strategic management. And I think these uh, are all very familiar to the universities of applied sciences in Finland. Like in the next, you can see an example of Hakahelia, what kind of uh, modes for collaboration there are, and it starts on, on the strategic 
level uh, there is a strategic cooperation with, with companies. Hakahelia wants to promote entrepreneurship, for example, when we start up startups and um, it promotes lifelong learning, offering tailored in-house training. And what's um, I think special at Hakahelia, Hakahelia can offer teachers work placement period so that the teachers can go to work in, in companies for some period, periods to update their own knowledge. Then there are advisory boards for curricular development, uh, students, mobility in, in many ways. They have their internship. They do course projects for companies and, and most uh, majority of the theses are, are done for the companies. Uh, teachers can work as um, consultants for the companies and RD is done together. So this is uh, an example what in practice does the business university collaboration mean. And uh, the best practices in implementation, I would say, is that the future is planned together with the partners, companies. Uh, also, you know, the strategic questions are discussed with the companies. There are common objectives. Management must be committed. And uh, then there is pro broad involvement of teachers and, and students work on real projects. And then um, in, in the beginning, in universities of applied sciences, there was no research and development. Uh, the universities of applied sciences started with education and business collaboration, and the RFD became the task of, of the university a little bit later on. And the starting point for this, this was that the RFD was based on the needs of the business and also the idea not only develop the um, uh, individual companies, but also develop the regional economy. And focus was and is on problem sol solving activities. And, and in practice, universities of applied sciences can develop new or improve products, services, devices, methods. So it's very, very near the practice what the companies are doing. In the next, there are some examples of Hakahelia projects, but I think that there are about 40 projects going on at Hakahelia at this moment. So these are only some examples. At the first one, the Hotel of Tomorrow is an example of a company level project. The next Basila Living Lab project is an example of regional development. Basila is a new area of Helsinki, Helsinki City. And then there is the artificial intelligence that is an example of how the universities of applied sciences can promote um, bringing the new, new theories and ideas also for the small and medium-sized companies. The next uh, slide will give an idea about the development, what has happened. In the beginning, there was the question, what is the research? Is it something what is done in academic universities where the esteem publications are important? But very, very soon it was 
noticed that uh, it, it must be something else in universities of applied sciences and, and the triple helix mal, uh, model was, was very important. So the, the cooperation with, was with higher education, uh, government and industry. And then it was noticed that something is missing. We need also the end users inside, inside the progress, um, projects. And today we can speak about ecosystems that are quite complicated systems of different kind of actors. And in the strategic are the best practices in implementing R&D. And again, I would uh, emphasize the strategic focuses and goals and uh, criteria for good projects. And uh, what is also important is clear reporting systems and, and the forums for teachers and, and to to the staff, other staff to share the knowledge what they gain through the projects and forums for collaboration with business and industries. Uh, again, if we compare the time of the colleges, there was no international activity. But the at, at that time, in the beginning of the 1990s, it was seen that the business is international and it is coming more and more international. So the reason was for this internationalization was that uh, we wanted to offer graduates uh, the experience and, and, and the, to give them the um, uh, knowledge how to work in international environments. It was seen, seen necessary because every, everything is today so international and the students have, have to be, be at home in international environments. So little by little, during the reform also the internationalization took steps. First there were student mobility, teacher mobility, then uh, curriculums and uh, English degree programs to make the student exchange possible. Then, uh, then we went deeper, different kind of partnership and strategic alliances within foreign universities. Today there are several European universities projects. There are um, universities from different EU countries operating together. And in, in the, last, the last step there is the exporting of education services. So this is very briefly, but uh, to give an idea that what has happened in this internationalization. And next, there is uh, um, about the continuous learning. It is very important. And in the next slide, I, I uh, just would like to emphasize that uh, lifelong learning is very important and it has been part of the universities of applied sciences as, as long as they have been working. Then uh, when we think about the, the reform, uh, also the reform has required the management reform. And um, you get the idea clear when you think about the old colleges, and we can say that in, in the colleges, the management was administration. Uh, like the idea that the rector, rector knows everything and, and, and can say what to do. 
but that, that was not enough when we got the bigger, bigger institutions and, and more complicated problems to handle on. And in the next slide, you can see the model how to, how to manage the University of Applied Sciences. This is based on the research and book uh, Lauri Tuomi and I, I have done. And very briefly, I can say that there is the idea that on the other hand, there is business. On the other hand, there is the, our, our students and, and the uh, University of Applied Sciences between these two two words. And if you think about the management, first you have to understand the history, and then you have to understand the operational environment. There are global trends, there are national trends, there are local trends, and you have to understand them. And what is the core in the management, I would say that it is strategic management, change management, and competence management. Those three are the core, core elements. And then there are the enablers of transformation. You have to manage those to take the reform continue. And uh, there at the end is the success of higher education institution. And on the last slide, um, there is the question of, of success. What is the success? What is the successful University of Applied Sciences? And um, I think it's important to see that the criteria criteria are not the same as for, for the best academic universities and, uh, for example, in the international ranking, ranking systems. We are not operating in the in, in same way. I would say that the most important criteria are the needs of the region and the local society people in, in, in the society. We emphasize these and they, they are important for us in, in a university of applied sciences. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ritawa. This is a great presentation to provide a very comprehensive introduction of the Finnish UAS, you know, also from the historical perspective. So you covered the essential issues very well, insightful, also with very many hands-on experiences which can be even learned by the practitioners. So thank you, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I think the, uh, your two presentations uh, supplement each other. So I think you also shared quite a, quite a common challenges. So from why the regional university or university of applied sciences were established and how universities are you know facing the challenges gone through the processes for instance teaching and research you both mentioned uh, when universities are changing changing the directions basically and the, the fundamental thing is how to change the teaching mode how to position the research i think you both covered the discussions on these issues, but from different perspectives. I think now we have a very good basis uh, for discussing how you know the two country experience can be compared, and for example, what China can learn from Finland as the focus of today's webinar. So before we open the floor to the audience, I would like to ask each of you uh, so briefly uh, reflect the following uh, issues as I actually already uh, mentioned, which are, how do you think the two countries, China, Finland, can be compared in terms of their um, regional or UAS universities? And if they are comparable, so what, what experience, for example, China can learn 
from Finland or from the Finnish perspective, Aurida, what you think your experience can offer to, to China? Uh, so Dr. Yang, uh, maybe you can start and then uh, we move on to the answers to Ritava. So please. Uh, thank you very much, especially uh, Ritava for the wonderful presentation, uh, especially regarding the teaching function, also the RDI function, the research function changes in the Finnish uh, perspective. Very interesting uh, experiences. So back to the question of uh, Professor Tsai, uh, you know, does the two countries reform comparable in what sense, right? Um, I think it's a very interesting question because uh, as we both uh, demonstrate the challenge, the environmental change was a critical thing. Uh, I think Litava uh, referred it as a uh, mega trends, right? <laughs> like the globalization changing of the uh, world of work. I think that's similar. But I think more uh, make these two countries reform comparable, I think was the role of the government. Uh, I think in the, in the, in the Chinese case, there always been this kind of uh, strategic uh, uh, planning uh, kind of mindset uh, from the government side, which is you know, to, to direct universities uh, into particular directions, uh, either being served the needs of the national government or serving the needs of a local economy. Um, so I think this kind of uh, uh, strategic thinking or planning is also demonstrated in the Finnish case. But I also want to mention the differences between the two countries or the when we do the comparisons, right? We always want to, <laughs> to, to, to make the differences, uh, to see the similarities and uh, differences. I think in Chinese, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are quite different levels of government, especially the central government sometimes are not, um, I mean, the ideology from the central government not necessarily adopted by the regional government or not necessarily by the regional universities. Uh, because regional uh, universities have, do have their priority, priorities. As I mentioned earlier, actually interesting enough from the 80s to 90s, uh, or even the early uh, uh, 21st century, I think the Chinese regional universities have been trying to emulate the research universities. So I have been going to this detour. First of all, the regional university want to be research university, and then they want to be a university of applied sciences or to do the applied research in science. Uh, education and, and research. So I think that's quite different to make Chinese uh, kind of transformation more complicated. Uh, I think um, one of the reasons is actually the role of the regional government because all the regional government want to have a flagship research universities at the local level. And they want to have this kind of university have the academic reputation. Um, so there have been kind of conflict interest even at the regional levels. Um, so I think that uh, because I don't know uh, details about the Finnish situation, but I, I think at least there are two competing goals of regional government. They also want research output. They also want applied <laughs> research to serve the economy. So they have this kind of competing interest. Yeah, so that's my uh, yeah, response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these ideas. And uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, not easy, easy in a way, it's not easy to compare because Finland is so small country and China is so huge. So it's very understandable that the government uh, must be something something different. And uh, here in Finland, the idea in, in the universities of applied sciences and also with the academic universities has been that uh, little by little, they have got more independence also in, in management. And I, I think this is something that uh, has been very important and in, encouraged, encouraging for, for the universities and, and for the management. And um, when I think about this, what is common for us, so I think we are, um, operating in, 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 in the same world, we have the same global challenges in, in the future. There is the climate change and there is the aging population and uh, we still have people with a low standard of living. So there are these kind of big questions and uh, we have to find answers to them at the same time when we are 
promoting local companies in, in their operations. But the, but the big big questions they they are they are the same for us everyone on, on, on the global and globe. And um, I also listened to the previous previous webinar. It was very interesting and here yeah, it was very nicely say, said there that uh, in in China and Finland we are both open for new ideas. We are pragmatic countries and we have the respect of education. And I I think these are very good starting points for the development work we we are doing. Yes, thank you. Uh, since Rita, while you have a rich experience as a leader of uh, US, you know, from the management perspective, uh, given also your understanding of the challenges possibly faced by Chinese, you know, counterparts. So what you, you can advise to uh, the Chinese regional university leaders, so for example, how to deal with the challenges regarding the teaching and uh, research transition or the changing mode of the teaching and the research yes um, from the management point of view i i would uh, emphasize the understanding of, of the big trends so called mega mega rents what what is happening what are the questions we we have to answer and um, and then the strategy in, in the university, it, it must be clear and it is very important that uh, every, um, the whole staff in the university understands the strategy in, in the same day. What are the goals? What are, are the uh, objectives for our operation? And, how we can promote the cooperation inside our university. So I think the model uh, earlier was that the teachers, professors, they are uh, operating alone and, and they, are, they are the masters alone. But in this complicated world, we, it's not enough, we have to put the knowledge of many people together and, and we have to operate together and in groups and teams. And it's, it's um, also a challenge for the management how to build this kind of operating groups and promote the work of, of the groups. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I think you, you indeed, you know, touch very essential issue how to, for example, start with building the common vision, you know, consensus, you know, have a committed group to make the change. Uh, so I think given the time limit, I will stop my questions. Now I try to invite some uh, uh, audience to raise their questions. So we have the first uh, person asking question in the chat box. So Wen Dan Qian, uh, can you unmute your mic and directly raise your question to our speakers? Yes, thank you, Professor Tsai. Uh, hello, Ridva. Thanks for sharing your presentation to us. My question is, in your presentation, you have mentioned from early teacher-directed direct model to today's learning-centered approach. Uh, so. I'm curious about what kind of challenges did Finland meet during the reform? Uh, yes. Mm. How to? This is this is a big, big question, and it has been a long, long way to um, change from this teacher directed model, and I I think that it has started from that that uh, mm, we have had enough discussions today so that we understand the change and why it is needed and how it is um, getting us more if we um, get get the learners learners 
to operate themselves. In a way, it is easy for a teacher to um, make your lessons and, and uh, go to the class, classroom and, and speak an hour there. But uh, it is a different job when, when you have to prepare the lesson thinking that uh, what's the goal you will try to gain and what do the students have to do so that they, they will during the lessons gain, gain the uh, goals. And uh, it has needed um, thinking and uh, also new pedagogical uh, knowledge, knowledge for the teachers and, and uh, teachers operating together so that they can share the knowledge, they can share their experiences and they can share what has been functioning and what is not functioning. And, uh, it has been, been a long process. It doesn't happen in, in a moment. It takes time. But, uh, but when there is the will, will, as it said, when there is the will, there is, is the way to do it. OK, thank you, Ridova, for answering my question. Thank you. Thank you, Ridova. Uh, now we, uh, we have uh, more questions from the audience. So the next uh, uh, question is from uh, uh, Jean Evans. Can you uh, unmute your microphone and directly ask with your question? Yes, this is me, uh, Dr. Tai. <laughs> this is me, uh, Yeah. Uh, my question is thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tsai, and I thank uh, Rita and uh, Dr. Yang for excellent uh, output for the communication uh, and sharing uh, this evening. Uh, it's quite insightful. And uh, uh, the first question to Rita. Uh, so uh, from the uh, practice of uh, Hagihalia, uh, how do you value the uh, relationship between RDI, the research, development, and innovation, uh, and, and uh, teaching or learning in your institution? Thank you, that's a simple question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, simple question, but very, very important question. And uh, um, I, I, I think that the RRP and, and teaching, um, they say they should go together. There is the ten tendency that uh, that we will do projects and uh, teachers teachers will will do the projects, but uh, I think it's it's the best when we have projects that we can take the students with us. So it's a very good way for the students to do things. It's the same as if they are working in a company, if they can participate in these projects and learn, learn by doing in, in the projects. And at the same time, of course, they are, they are helping, helping teachers in, in these projects. So, and, and when we get the results of these research prog programs, there is the idea that we can use this information in, in the following lessons and in the following process. So all, all the time, the, uh, the amount of knowledge is, is growing and, and we can use that in, in teaching. Yeah. Thank you, Ritawa, for responding. Uh, thank you, Mayun, for asking this uh, very important question. Uh, also, you know, in Finland or in the Finnish US, the term is not a research, but it's a RDI. I think that's also, you know, makes some different meanings. Uh, the, it's itself, RDI is some kind of, you know, a redefinition of research in the context of the US. Um, but yes. I, I want to take an opportunity, I think, since there's no uh, further questions from uh, the chat box, I want to uh, bring, bring back one question uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Yang, because you mentioned the positioning is the key challenge for Chinese regional universities because they are not you know, on the 
went to the position. So they are below the national research universities. That that's, that is a challenge. But how do you think uh, any experience from Finland can be useful as a solution or as some potential solution for for China to resolve the problem? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cai uh, Professor Cai, for this uh, very important question. Again, uh, I want to refer to uh, Litava's earlier comments on the unique uh, positioning, if you like, uh, of US in Finland. I think in her presentation, the use of phrase uh, dignify the professional and vocational education or dignify the professional education. And the, and the main goal of the uh, uh, University of Applied Sciences in terms of education was uh, producing professionals and jointly with business, if I understand correctly. Um, I think that's really uh, insightful observations. I think it's also highly relevant for China. Uh, because right now, as I mentioned earlier, we have this kind of polarization. So the university either be vocational or be academic. Um, so the applied also have the uh, connotation of vocational. But I think from the Finnish experiences, this new conceptualization of a professional or professional higher education, I think is really important. Because being professional uh, higher education, you don't have not necessarily to be with vocational or academic, right? So you're open to the world of work. And professional, um, as uh, I think uh, Litava put it correctly, is a combination of the theory and the practice. Right, so this is a new type of, uh, as we said, new type of education institution with a new mission. Uh, I think that's really the solution, uh, where the solutions are, right? Because you always struggle uh, if you, I mean, in China, because right now the regional university was uh, the mindset was occupied with, uh, they try to do uh, at the research side, they want to be academic. In the education side, they want to be applied. So it's kind of um, going different ways, right? So, but if you use this idea of professional education or professional uh, higher education institutions, and then you could do research which can either be academic uh, or applied depending on the professional needs, right? Because the profession is combination of theory and practice, right? So I think in that, in that sense, it could be um, really interesting now to be struggle. You know, if you're always struggling with this idea about uh, research and education was actually divorced, <laughs> so that would be very difficult. But I think from the Litava's presentation, or from the experiences of Finnish US, actually the two things were actually married and married well. <laughs> so they will have this kind of integration of the RDI function and education function. So I think I think using the professional uh, higher education, this concept, we can uni unify these two missions together. And then the regional university may find some peace <laughs> in terms of their mission uh, because there are a lot of discussion about a uh, mission uh, adrift, right? Um, being too academic, now to do applied. And so I think that this is really one thing I think we can take from the Finnish experiences. It's quite uh, important. Um, but we, 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 we need to learn also from Finnish how to do that. Uh, that's the importance of the management side, right? Little bit actually mentioned uh, also from her, her papers or, uh, um, on the Finnish experiences that take a lot of work to set up this kind of organization, organizational uh, 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 function or organizational setup to, to support this kind of integration. So for that part, we really need to learn from US. I think uh, from my, my joint work with the previously, we understand from the Eastern, Eastern Finland uh, University of Applied Sciences and the uh, Temporal University of Applied Sciences, uh, they do differently in terms of organizational model. So we want to know more, uh, for instance, Hala um, uh, Hiliga in other universities, how they do it. So I think that will be uh, uh, ultimately very valuable for the Chinese counterpart to understand uh, how to find the new solutions. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Good, very, very important question. And uh, I, I, I can tell that in the beginning when the universities of applied sciences were established, there was uh, a uh, strong discussion going, going on, what, what is the role of this and what they are and what they uh, can do and what they are allowed to do and uh, academic universities were against of, of universities of early sciences, they thought that we, we came to compete from the same, same money, money and, and um, 
money and reputation and all, all kind of questions. And in the beginning, it was not possible that the rectors of the universities and rectors of the applied universities would sit in the same meetings. We had different, different meetings. And uh, so, but the little by little, the role of the universities of applied sciences were found. And I, I think that today the situation is quite good and all, all the rectors can have a meeting in the, in the same room and together. So, so it, it has happened, but, uh, but it happened little by little. Yeah, very insightful discussions between uh, the two speakers. I think uh, uh, Professor Yang also mentioned that this is also a matter of uh, uh, building a new identity of uh, regional universities in China. So, for example, professional higher education can be a concept, you know, be used in China and also, you know, uh, to be more explicitly, you know, used in Chinese context to create the new identity of the U.S. Uh, I think this is this was some challenge faced in Finland as well. Rita also mentioned, but among many other means, so legislation in Finland is also very important because in Finland the two kinds of higher education institutions are regulated by two laws. Uh, however, in China there is only one higher education law. So all type of higher education institutions are under the same legislation framework. So that might be the, uh, the differences. So would you like to somehow continue to reflect on, on this point? Yes, we have had discussions for, for a long time to get, get the, uh, one law for all, all kind of universities, but uh, we have not yet managed in that. So I, I, I think that it's great that in, in China you have one law and, and all, all the institutions can work under, under one, one law. So there is something that, that we, we can learn and, and uh, think how, how to make that in, in Finland also. Um, <laughs> I, I think the uh, story a little bit complicated than the, um, the story, um, just one law ruling the uh, US and uh, uh, research university here in China. Actually, we have uh, one uh, higher education act or higher education law. However, uh, many of the regional universities, especially uh, three years vocational uh, oriented universities will enter the vocational law, <laughs> vocational education law, rather than the higher education act. So it's complicated because our uh, Vocational Education Act just uh, amended uh, and uh, last uh, two, two months ago in, in March. So under the new, new Vocational Education Act, actually the government extended, although the legislator actually extended vocational education from the uh, secondary level and tertiary level until the professional education level. So the vocational education degrees can confer at the master level or even the PhD level. So this is, uh, ideologically follow the German model, right? The US in German can confer degrees at the PhD level. But there have been a lot of um, debate, if you like, in China, because it's, it seems to be right now, the regional universities, when they confer degrees in vocational oriented uh, disciplines, they can confer degrees at the master or, or PhD level. However, they were considered vocational. So, <laughs> so that makes the situation even more complicated because as a, a little bit, uh, Proposed earlier, we should enter the same law, right? The so we should have the equal uh, footing and also the equal kind of uh, treatment. But right now, of course, we will have only one higher education, higher education act. However, the vocational education act also consider regional university part of their systems. So uh, I have to say that a lot of uh, unsolving issues. So maybe we can discuss further in the following seminars <laughs> organized by. Uh, by Professor Tsai. <laughs> and we can have some legal scholars to participate. That'll be very interesting. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, event. Uh, a very uh, uh, impressive presentations. Hopefully, you know, all, all the audience, also potential, you know, audience uh, not in the, in the current room will also benefit from uh, 
your talks and the, and the discussions. I think uh, indeed, you know, in the end, so we also opened new topics for future discussions. Hope, you know, we have uh, the opportunity to collaborate again. But uh, by now, I think, you know, uh, the time is up. So I think uh, people are busy. So it's better we keep the schedule. And once again, thank you, uh, our speakers and all the audience here. Uh, for also for your active participation in the discussions. Thank you, everyone.